Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 132. We are still in the midst of Jesus' betrayal and subsequent arresting that is happening outside or near the the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, last week we saw where Judas identifies his betrayer with that mob of people that he brought with him by a kiss to his rabbi and it's interesting Jesus is just you would really betray the son of man with a kiss with a with a sign of endearment and love that would be common in their culture like yeah what a what a slap in the face to <laughs> his teacher and brother over the past 3 years of life that's probably the closest Jesus ever got to saying something like you suck <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's pretty accurate um <laughs> but but he he rebuts pretty well by ushering after they ask him who they're seeking they ask him who they're seeking and they say jesus of nazareth he finally gives that last i am statement yeah. uh, by saying i am he and you have all these parallels back to abraham and moses and there's connection to god's name the Hanuni and and even just the, the the power of God's voice being showcased in the scriptures of God and Messiah being able to thwart his enemies just with speaking of his voice. Yeah. Um, and you see that with all of the soldiers fall into the ground and like disarray and unbelief. Um, it was a really powerful moment. Yeah, it was. In the midst of all this drama. So they do wind up arresting him. Jesus kind of, I don't know, in some ways it's a, he's exclaiming just the absurdity of the situation. It's like, I've, I, 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 t- well, after Peter gets, goes rage mode and cuts off one of the <laughs> Malchus's ear, Jesus right. stops all of the commotion, heals the guy's ear, and then basically submits to the arresting, but in the midst of that he says like i i was in the synagogues and i was in the temple i was teaching and you sat there and you were around me and now like you're you're at this moment of complete like pandemonium that you're going to take me and he said but this has to be done because of the fulfillment of scriptures yeah with what the prophet said that the messiah the suffering messiah must do and then we ended last week with a almost naked man that st- stuck around Jesus after all of his disciples had fled who later became fully naked after yeah. they they tried to seize him and they uh, they took his loincloth so yeah, his messing robe. up our family friendly show here <laughs> what's up with that now no all those things are great Samuel and one of the things that popped in my head just as a what really affected me about that part of the scripture was the imagery. This was a large crowd that came after him. And they weren't just average people. I mean, there were a lot of soldiers and whatnot. It, that imagery still is is not what I grew up with. Mm-hmm. And so that's neat, too. Well, all right, so let's go on. They, they've they grabbed him. They're taking him away. What happens? So we're going to go to John first. And just to let you know, the sequencing of these events, wow, this gets rough, and nobody seems to agree. So if you don't like the way I do it, sorry. You can do it a different way yourself, whatever. I'm just trying to make sense of, of whatever, and this, this seemed like a good way to go through the story for me. So anyway, here we go. John chapter 18, verses 13 and 14. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Okay, now we talked about that uh, as Caiaphas uh, was kind of like the, not unwilling, 
un- unexpected prophet or something. He didn't he didn't really quite understand what he was saying, and and mm. it really fit into God's story, whether he knew it or not. So that was kind of cool. But anyway, we aren't told why. Why did they do this? But first, they take him to Annas, Anas. He had served as the high priest, but it was like 15 or 20 years ago from this point. And, okay, a high priest is supposed to be high priest for life, but remember how we've talked about how this had all turned into a money game and a power game and, you know, who was with Rome and all. So that's why he's still around and yet he's not the high priest or whatever. But interestingly, Annas, he's kind of like a crime boss. I mean, in a way, he he virtually controlled the priesthood, either you know himself directly or through his family, for about sixty years. And you know, John tells us Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. He's the, Caiaphas is the currently serving high priest, and this this is going to be important for understanding the sequence of events. John is the only one who tells us about this little time here with Annas. However, you're going to see some of the details between the time with Annas and the time with Caiaphas. I don't know. Maybe they're getting a little bit confused. Maybe uh, whatever. It's, it's, it's going to be hard. But here's an important point, just sort of physically, or I don't know if you want to call it geographically or whatever. It's possible that Annas and Caiaphas shared a courtyard. They, they had separate homes, but they shared a courtyard. So, I don't know. I guess you can decide whether or not that makes this any more or less confusing. But anyway, they take him to him first. And again, John, he also goes and reminds us that Caiaphas was the one who'd played the uh, unintentional prophet. He declared that it would be for the benefit of the people that one die instead of the many or one in place of the many. And of course, we look back at that, think about Jesus, his ministry, what it is he accomplished as Messiah, God's plan, all of that. And we see that this one dying the way he did, undeserved suffering, undeserved death, and what that makes available for us. You know, it, it's, it's, it's great. But again, Caiaphas, I don't think he has any comprehension of what he said. Mm-hmm. So anything there, Samuel? Just, it's remarkable that the lullaby effect in my previous readings of the Gospels, and I just really haven't noticed Anas Anas as this right character at play here in the midst of all of this, these important events that are leading to Jesus' death. And it's interesting that I almost get the sense that the text is kind of hinting that Anas, Anas is the one with really the one with the power and um, Caiaphas may be just like a puppet in terms of doing the will of this crime boss like you said so I'm I'm intrigued to see how the dynamic plays out as the text unfolds yeah yeah it it does appear he he's kind of like always in the background influencing pulling strings whatever but yeah he's the Caiaphas. jewish version of the godfather there you go that's right yeah but caiaphas you know he he does he plays his role so we've got plenty of bad guys to go around how about that <laughs> fair yeah and by the way john is the only one who tells us about this so we have three other accounts where he's not in there at all so you know it is i think somewhat easy to oh i forgot about that guy mm. yeah i remember that name what what was he doing Yeah. All right. Well, let's keep going. We're still in John chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants 
and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Okay, now as I read that, I'm guessing part of you was going, but the last episode and, and everybody ran away and the mm-hmm. naked guy and all that. What, what? I mean, we'd just been told that the disciples fled. But apparently it wasn't all just, you know, butts and elbows running for their lives. Peter had followed. And I don't know, I guess we have to assume covertly in some way. And he wasn't even the only one. There was another unnamed disciple. Now, We've seen John do this before, and most believe that this is John's sly way of referring to himself. He's done it a handful of times in his gospel. And so we're just going to go ahead and refer to him as John and hope that we're not wrong. But here's the interesting part, Samuel. And again, you're probably having that, have I really read this before? John is known to the high priest, the the former high priest, Annas. We have no idea how, but because of this, he just follows Jesus into the courtyard. He's recognized. He can do that. This is very strange. Peter, however, you know, he just kind of has to hang around outside because nobody knows Peter. John, however, helps him out. He goes out. He speaks to the servant girl watching the door, and he gets Peter inside the courtyard. It was kind of that, he's with the bond moment, right? However, on his way in, the servant girl asks Peter if he is one of Jesus' disciples too. Now, listen to that. Are you one of his disciples also? Well, who's she thinking of? The only only other one there is John. And so, Are you one of Jesus' disciples like John is, right? There doesn't appear to be any reason for secrecy at this point. But Peter denies it anyway. He lies. Now, I don't know why he does that. It's very strange. And it's going to be kind of weird because we still have the other three Gospels, the Synoptics, where they have to have their first denial also. So that's going to get a little strange. But... Anyway, once Peter is inside, he joins the others that are inside. They would be like servants and officers all around a fire. It's cold. And just for a moment, we should at least remember Jesus is sweat-soaked. From Remember all his, his time in the garden, and they, they mm. took him. I don't know how long it took to get here. I, I doubt that he's fully dry at this point, right? went through his clothes, whatever, sweat. So he's probably pretty stinking cold, too. So Paul and I can attest to this, too, because we just came <laughs> back from a trip to Israel. And this, the, oh. I mean, in, in the text, this is nearing the same time of year we were there, like close to Passover. Yep. And it's the, the, the season of the year in Israel called the latter rains, where <laughs> you have one more kind of stint of moisture that the land receives before it starts getting hot and dry for like the next six months and right. especially if it rains and then it and then it g- goes to nightfall like we it was cold like in the <laughs> 40s a couple of those days so yeah i don't know i've never noticed that in the text either but that's a really cool detail that i'm connecting in a new way now that's right yeah we have new new imagery in our heads we've experienced it differently it's great yeah so if you're building you know the 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 movie in your head these are all important little points seeing what's going on and again we're going to have slight i don't know disjointedness or discrepancy whatever with the synoptics but you know we're in john we're going with it so anything else in there samuel yeah i do have one more question Things seem backward in my mind, the way that I'm looking at the text, because we just got done last week seeing that mob treating Jesus as almost this quote-unquote enemy to the state, and his disciples would have been treated likewise by association. 
and then the arrest happens and this mob now has custody of Jesus. In my mind, I feel like wouldn't it make sense for you to not, if you're a disciple of Jesus, to not be recognized by that band of people if you're trying to follow him to get into this courtyard to see what's playing out? Or is it right. this this Annas character, this courtyard that the text is saying is actually we should treat it as his private residence and the only way anyone could get in there is if they actually knew the owner of the property and in this case John did, which allowed him to enter and then subsequently allow Peter to enter. Yeah. Oh, definitely. This is the high priest's, and as you said, private residence. In this case, it's a former high priest, but people don't just walk in and out, right? Okay. That's why they've got this girl guarding the door or watching the door, whatever you want to call it. Okay, granted, it's a girl. I don't think they're expecting violent break-in or whatever, but you can't just walk in and out. And so, yeah, it's if you're not paying attention when you're reading, it's really weird to think, wait a second, one of Jesus's disciples was known at Annas's house? But how weird is that? And it is weird, but that that's the only way that Peter even gets in. And in theory, so some of the scholars, they look at this and they go, well, how do we even know what happened with Jesus in there? How do we get any of this conversation? The theory is that John is the only one in there that was able to come and tell everybody else, this is what happened, this is what was said, mm-hmm. because he's the only one in. Peter, we don't even know how much he can hear. We'll talk about that later as well. But yeah, it's a, it's weird, right? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay. That's... Anything else? <laughs> nope. All right. Yeah. This. Uh, yeah. It's. It's. This is why we go through it, Samuel. <laughs> Find out all the things that we just don't know. (laughs) All right. So John chapter 18, verses 19 through 24. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Another weird little moment, right? Hmm. So Annas, he questions Jesus. And specifically, I guess he's asking about his disciples Uh, We don't know, but, I mean, you think that it would be stuff like, who are they, where are they, and, you know, we just talked about it. Hey, a couple of them are really close, (laughs) right? But uh, he also asked him about his teaching. We can only imagine he's looking for things that are either insightful, that that are going to be trouble for him, or maybe... I don't know, maybe some teaching that's wrong somehow. I, I don't know. We did, Whatever. He's questioning him. Now, this, to me, this had the potential to be a super interesting dialogue. I, I want to hear what he asked and what Jesus answered, but Jesus just isn't really interested. Jesus, remember we talk about this uh, on occasion, Samuel, and I know people talk about it in churches, whatever. Jesus, he was indeed meek. He was humble, but he wasn't a doormat. He had strength. He had fortitude. And so Jesus responds by saying, hey, I've always spoken openly, you know, and I mean, everywhere, synagogues, temple, anywhere Jews gather. There are no secrets. I have no secrets. You didn't arrest me and bring me here personally to get these questions answered. You couldn't have. I mean, why didn't you just ask all those who heard me? 
they can tell you what I said. And now that kind of kind of sounds like a little bit of a snarky response. True? A mm-hmm. little bit. What are you asking me for? Why don't you just ask them? Okay. However, this was actually proper protocol for a Jewish court. You question witnesses. You do not question the defendant. Now, I know our modern view, we think, oh, well, sometimes a defendant, you know, takes the stand, his own defense, whatever. In Jewish courts, that would have been either super rare or non-existent. You question witnesses and you had to have two or three of them agreeing about things. That's going to come up as well. So anyway, Jesus answers like this. And again, you know, we can look at it and go, yeah, that did seem a little snarky, but there's, there's important protocol behind it. One of the officers didn't like Jesus's attitude or his words or something. So he strikes him, right? Very roughly, (laughs) as Monty Python would say. Now, are you really going to talk that way to the high priest, mister? I mean, that's kind of what he's getting at. Again, Annas is a former high priest, but still there's a, a great degree of respect and honor for, I don't know, the office or the title, maybe for the man, I don't know. They were considered appropriate. And so this guard, this officer, felt like, Jesus wasn't showing a proper degree of respect or honor. But Jesus stands his ground. If I've said something wrong, let's hear it. But if I'm speaking, you know, obvious, logical, rational truth, you didn't need to bring me here to get these questions answered. Why are you striking me? And again, you see that strength, that fortitude. And for whatever reason, Anna, he doesn't appear to be in the mood to play around, so he's pretty much done. He just sends Jesus on to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, the current high priest. You know, whatever. I thought I was going to help. This seems messy. Uh, Let him take care of it. Anything there, Samuel? Yeah. uh, Could we say that this is the principle of first mention the first time that the text shows Jesus getting physically harmed by someone. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. I, uh, I, at this moment, I certainly can't recall any yeah. other time. So what, what would that mean or what does it lead to? What, what's, uh, what do we take from it? Mm. Well, at least in maybe I'm, reading too much into this but I, f- I feel like I have read and heard stuff that in eastern cultures the like that phrase uh, struck Jesus with his hand oftentimes is like done I, I mean it could be it could have been a forehand slap or a backhand slap but the that the, the whole concept of that is very demeaning and it, it just it's a form of belittling that person. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I guess that's kind of present in Western culture too. I mean, no one wants to get slapped in the face, but it's. I think it's much more concentrated of an effect over there. So, um, yeah, it's. I don't know. It's kind of a big moment to denigrate the literal Messiah that you've been hoping for in that manner. So, and it, it's kind of foreshadowing the kind of treatment he's going to get as the text proceeds. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. And I think just to put a fine point on it, I think it's much more likely that it was backhanded. The modern American phrase, I'm not going to say it, but you'll get the idea. Yeah. It was B slapped. Yeah. Right. And yeah, I, th- I think the point of it was to denigrate him, be, uh, mm-hmm. embarrass him. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. I think that was all part of it. And yeah. So yeah, you're right. This was, this was kind of a pivotal moment in that. His his suffering, well, all of it, I, it begins right there. Uh, you know, the arrest, whatever. Yeah, but yeah, that's good. I like it. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> um, the other quick thing is, and by no means am I trying to defend this high priest or the Sadducees as a group. I think in the text shows itself plainly that they're a rotten group of people uh, within the nation of Israel. But I'm just trying to think within your 
system that you painted in terms of the judicial system of like questioning uh, witnesses first before the defendants. The text doesn't say it, but they're like there's so much time over the past three years of Jesus's ministry where he has taught and interacted with the public that Annas or Caiaphas they, and people that they are leading, they could have potentially asked witnesses and more than likely the witnesses would have given them the same response in terms of the consistency of Jesus's message, right. that he was not instigating a rebellion within the nation, that he was trying to showcase the essence of Torah to the people. And if that is the case, then that just shows the absurdity of Jesus's rest, arrest even more. It's like yeah. if you're if you are bringing someone into question concerning their identity or authority as a potential figure for Messiah, why would you arrest them? You would want to usher them down with dignity and respect to like, actually have a legitimate conversation and then make your conclusions from there instead of it being a a form of like a judicial flexing of power. I don't know. I just, I don't know yeah. if that helps at all, but it just, those things were in my mind to showcase how much more exaggerated the priesthood was in, in these moments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it really emphasizes, highlights the disingenuous nature of everything that they were doing. So, yeah, that's good. And uh, again, we recognize, come on, really, this is just Jesus l talking to a guy in his private house who's not even really the high priest. There's nothing official here. There's no official court. Right. But I, I we point those things out because it's going to be treated as an official court with Caiaphas. And we're going to see that that isn't really well done or well formed either. So, yeah, all very interesting stuff. But, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's, uh, well, let's just go with they're not being real no. with us. Yeah, they're they're playing around. So it's bad. All right, the next bit. Now we're going to move over to the synoptics. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 and 58, Mark chapter 14, verses 53 and 54, and Luke chapter 22, verses 54 and 55, and, you know, we're, we've already looked at the very first part of that sentence in 54 for Luke, so I'm going to read from Mark. I might add a little something in from Matthew, but let's read from Mark. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Uh, well, here, Matthew adds one little thing right at the end. He says that Peter sat with the guards to see the end. I thought that was kind of amazing that Matthew writes it as if, yep, we know what's coming. But <laughs> anyway, so uh, now again, I mentioned a little bit of, well, there's there's some things that match, but then there's some things that don't between the synoptics and John, whatever. Obviously, some little bit of that probably sounded like, didn't we just hear that? It sounds like a brief summary of what John had just relayed in detail. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. The difference is John includes the detail of hey, he went to Annas first and then to Caiaphas. Here, it appears to be just straight to Caiaphas. Okay, so Jesus is before Caiaphas, and now the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders come together. And listen to what it says. All the chief priests, the elders, and scribes. Okay. That seems like a pretty all-inclusive group, right, Samuel? Yeah. <laughs> but these are the pre- dawn hours it, it doesn't seem likely that every one of them is there and in fact just think a little further the Pharisees like them or not they, they are real sticklers for proper procedure etc etc 
And we're going to see that that is totally lacking. And so when it says that all of them were there, I think that we need to take that with a grain of salt. And as we continue, I think we'll see more clearly. Yeah, there's no way that it was all of them. There was nothing official about this at all. But let's keep going. As, As we continue, it's going to become, I think, more apparent that these are likely all of the ones who actively oppose Jesus's. Jesus as a character, or all of these who side with Caiaphas, or, you know, something of that nature. But anyway, we pointed it out, we know it's there, and yet the rest of the text doesn't seem to support that as something to be taken literally. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Anyway, Peter ends up in the same place. He's warming himself at a fire with the servants and the guards, and again, Matthew tells us that Peter's here to watch the end. As much as he hates it, as much as he probably doesn't want it to be so, we get the sense from Matthew's telling that Peter knows what's coming. Not much else to say there, Sam. You got anything? Just one thing. I'm glad that you pointed out this detail that it's probably not an all-inclusive group considering the circumstances and the time of day slash night that it is. Um, and it's going to I'm, I'm going to attempt to do this, and hopefully people who are listening can d- do it as well to have our Pharisee monitor on to see if the text actually brings them up from now until Jesus' ultimate death. Because, I mean, we've talked about it so many times that the church paints the Pharisees as they're the bad guys, they're the ones who killed Jesus, but... yeah. I think maybe the text is going, if if we are cognizant and are picking up on who the characters the text is actually saying are present, I think we might be surprised at who actually is involved in this. Yeah, yeah. And, and to be fair, when it lists things like elders or scribes, definitely could have included Pharisees. Now, Pharisees, though, and this is the other thing, as I've already mentioned it, They're the big sticklers for proper procedure and everything else. And because we're not going to see much of that, that is another indicator that there aren't many of them. And one more thing. This is just, it seems like it's all contradictory, right? There were Pharisees who were actually big supporters of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There were some who were kind of on the fence. They didn't know what to do with him. And there were some who actually, let's just call them enemies, They would have sided with the Sadducees or whatever. So we could still imagine them, some of them being a part of this little group. And and yet I think your point is still super valid. They don't appear to be a part of this part of the story. But let's keep our eyes out and see what we see. Yeah, especially when the synoptics, we've seen examples in the past where the writers specifically mention the Pharisees as an entity of themselves. Yeah, yeah. The Gospels definitely like to call them out when they're messing up. So, yeah, to leave them out, it is in itself important. So, it's good. Anything else? Nope. Let's keep going. All right. So, the next section, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 to 62, and Mark chapter 14, verses 55 to 60. And I'm going to read from Mark. Now, the chief priests... And the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? All right. So the text says, The chief priests... And the whole council, let's say it that way, the Sanhedrin, I just made a comment about how it wasn't likely that his supporters were there. Now, am I just being dumb 
Well, maybe. (laughs) We always leave that possibility open. But in this case, again, I think it's important that we see a phrase like the whole council as not the literal every person who was a member of it, but something more like everyone who was in fact present at this moment. So the whole council, everybody who was present. Now, one very simple reason is because he did indeed have supporters among the Sanhedrin. There's uh, Nicodemus. Uh, Shoot, now I can't remember names. Now I started trying to list them. Uh, But there are in the text people that we know support him. And there are sort of those general comments of some in the priesthood who became disciples. Obviously, some of the Pharisees we've mentioned. So the point is, they wouldn't have been in agreement seeking testimony against him. And Matthew, I mean, he calls it out specifically. He says that they were seeking false testimony. So let's take a moment just to list some things that were out of order here. Okay, if we're going to look at this and we're going to think that it's a meeting of the council, something official, all of all of that, if we're if we're going to try to read it literally that way, well, here's a list of some things that don't seem to fit a true, official, sincere meeting. Okay, number one, this was a capital case. They were trying to put him to death. So in that sense, meeting in a private house, I'm sorry, that is completely out. It's a direct violation. Uh, Capital case, you you would never know this. They were meeting in the dark. It was before sunrise. Uh, it's, It's a direct violation. You can't do that. Here's another one. They were meeting on the eve of Passover. Okay, now these are going to get a little confusing. Remember how we had this big discrepancy between John and the synoptics? Mm -hmm. And we didn't know, is this the night before Passover? Is it the night before Sabbath? Is it all those things? So depending on whose story you believe and what day of the week you think it is, well, then they could have been meeting on the eve of Passover. Well, that's a big no-no. They could have been meeting on the eve of a Sabbath. Well, that's a big no-no. They were meeting, this is so important, meeting during the month of Nisan. The entire month. It's out of bounds. Can't do that. They, we're going to see, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to see this is a capital case and they declare the verdict the same day as the trial. It's a big no-no. Can't do that. Uh, There was false witness testimony that was accepted If they don't have agreeing testimony from two or more, it's considered false, but they accepted it. And if you have false testimony, the false witnesses are supposed to be punished very specifically when we're in the midst of a capital case. These false witnesses, at least the text doesn't say, that they were punished at all, but they were proven false. Here's another one. Capital case. Jesus had no defense attorney. He was just left to defend himself. It's totally out of bounds. Jesus' own words, and this is coming up, I know I'm speaking ahead a little bit, but his own words are used to incriminate him. Completely out of bounds. Caiaphas casts the first vote. It's completely backwards. He's supposed to cast the final, the last vote. And a unanimous guilty vote was supposed to be declared as a mistrial. And I know that sounds weird. If they're having a capital case and everyone, absolutely everyone agrees, this man is guilty and should die, they actually consider that a problem. And that's a mistrial. They have to do it again. No Mm -hmm. one sees any sort of doubt or, or any sort of mercy or anything like that. So I know you may or may not agree with all of the list or whatever, but I'm telling you, first century Judaism, all of these things were out of order, and we're going to see it play out. But anyway, this is them trying to find testimony against Jesus. In the end, they didn't have much luck. They found a lot of people to speak against him. The problem was that none of their testimony agreed. They needed the testimony of two or more valid, reliable witnesses And those two or more had to actually agree, and they couldn't find them. 
This is so important. Right at this moment, there's nothing official about this meeting, but even if it was, they do not have the testimony required to convict him. Finally, I mean, they do get a couple of guys who testify about Jesus saying that he would destroy the temple, but it even tells us their testimony didn't really agree either. But for whatever reason, this is the thing that gets Caiaphas all worked up. He's hearing, I don't know, modern English lingo, something like terrorism against the temple, right? That's what he's hearing. And so he questions Jesus. Do you realize how bad this is for you? Do you realize how bad these things are that are being said about you? (laughs) You could be in real trouble, mister, right? Aren't you even going to say anything? Now, threatening to destroy the temple, okay, that's bad. Building another not made with hands, well, that, I mean, how are you supposed to even take that? Building another temple not made with hands? That has to suggest something extraordinary and maybe even supernatural. I don't know, Messiah-like, God-like, something. Maybe all of this that's being said, maybe it would have been bad if it had been accurate. But it wasn't even what Jesus said or what Jesus was saying at all. And so Caiaphas is like, don't you have anything to say? Well, let's just see what Jesus has to say about it. But before we do that, Sammy, you got anything? Yeah, I have a few things. Um, For for someone like Caiaphas to be getting all worked up about terrorism against the temple, he would have been wrapped up around the finger of Herod's strategy to flex his influence from Rome in the way that he rebuilt the temple and you know Paul and I and the group that we went with saw that and how grand uh, Herod built the temple and extravagant and intricate in the ar- uh, the architecture and everything so yeah it's a uh, for someone who is jaded by the aesthetics um, it makes sense for the, him to be getting all in a tizzy um, like this yeah and just to say side note we we really can't imagine the grandeur of the temple in yeah. this day. Yeah. The, just whatever picture you have in your head is probably way greater than that. So mm-hmm. anyway, go ahead, Simon. And then um, the part that you brought up about the people were bearing witness against them and this testimony did not agree and you, you uh, kind of made this comment or question like, were any of his supporters there? Like, I think it's possible that... Not only could you have false witnessing going on where people's false accounts are not matching up, but in the midst of that, there could have been people present who were brave to speak actual truth out that actually happened concerning Jesus's authority and the things that he actually did. So I just wanted to give space there that there could have been people that were speaking truthful things that would have added into the confusion of testimony not matching up. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think you're right. They would have been very brave. Mm. Yeah. And um, the last thing, are we supposed to assume that Jesus got moved from Annas's private residence to Caiaphas's private residence? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, it's interesting to think that both of these accounts are happening within someone's private home, and then you have this large group of Jewish officials that are present there in the middle of the night as well. Like it just it just that doesn't come across as like happenstance. It's it it feels right, and all this sounds probably so duh and common sense, but it just me saying it helps me at least it it's very it sounds very strategic like yeah that that whole group of people knew ahead of time what they were going to do and that they were going to bring jesus to these private quarters like it wasn't just like a a sudden announcement like knock on someone's door hey we finally got jesus like come on down like we're gonna we're gonna try to get him convicted like no this was this was a, a ploy 
Yeah, and even if it was like, uh, hey, go knock on people's doors, think about that. Whose doors would they go knock on? Hey, go get everybody who's on our side. Mm. Right? So both scenarios, no, no matter how you view it, it's easy to see how, uh, yeah, when it says all, maybe it really isn't all. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the guys the, the conspiring together, let's say. Yeah. Anything else? That's it. All right. So let's do one more. This is Matthew chapter 26, verses 63 to 66. Mark chapter 14, verses 61 to 64. And Luke chapter 22, verses 66 to 71. Uh, You know what? I'm going to read from Mark and I'll grab a little bit from Luke as well. Mark says this. But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So, let me let me do this little bit from Luke because he adds something very very interesting. He starts out by saying, "When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. Now, this is really interesting because this kind of throws a wrench in the whole we're at a house thing. We don't exactly know what this means. First of all, it's not dark anymore. Luke tells us that, that daytime shows up, but, but you know, we're going to hear about that later as well so we've got some discrepancy here and it says they led him away to their council well where was that did they actually go to a more official meeting place and who was there stuff like that so we're we're reading it out loud we don't want to act like it's not there but it's not in full agreement with what we're seeing in the rest of the story so we don't we don't really know what to do with it but we're throwing that out there going hey you you need to know that that is there the, the the difficulty though, and now this this is where it gets even worse, is me trying to put the sequence of events together. I had to really mess up Luke's account. I had to take things out of order so that like events could be uh, happening together because we're trying to put these all together, right? So Luke's account is out of order. So the fact that we say something about day coming and all that and being led away, well, in Luke's telling, if you just went straight through, that would happen later. And so we've got this weird, what's the real order? What happened where and when? This is part of the difficulty as well. I, you're just going to have to, as a listener, as you're a studier, whatever, somehow in this, you're going to have to come to grips with your own all right, well, I think what Paul said in this part made sense or not, or I think maybe it should be this way or or not, or whatever. Guys, we're just trying to put this in a, in an order, and it's hard. It's just hard. So anyway, that complicates things. Which sequence is right? Who knows? I'm just going with what I think fits together nicely as a single whole story, but I have to recognize that when I do that, I've got things kind of mixed up. Uh, and Luke's the only one that says it's daylight, but uh, the story he includes after he says it's daylight, well, it actually lines up with the other gospel story that's happening before daylight. So, I, you know, whatever. If you have a better way, go with it. Let's just go with what I've got here. Now, at first, Jesus says nothing to defend himself, and everyone seems quite frustrated with him. So they just ask him outright, are you the Christ. Now, each of the Gospels has a different way of presenting this. 
in in Matthew, Caiaphas is actually demanding that Jesus answer. And so I just want to bring this in. If we were actually in a proper court, Jesus, and this is important because he is without sin, he perfectly keeps Torah, right? Jesus would have been bound by Torah to answer. A clear and unambiguous yes to the question would have been sedition to the Romans, and Caiaphas's work would have been done. Now, what we see, though, is in Matthew, the one where we see the clear demanding, in Matthew and Luke, his answers, I don't know, they maybe sound a little bit more evasive to us, but I don't think they really are. When he says the phrase, you have said it, or you have said so, or whatever it was he says, we look at that and and it's like, ah, yeah, he's not really saying it, but in this time, in this culture, looking at other writings of the era, that is, it's kind of an idiomatic phrase that's basically saying, you are correct. So I'm going to suggest that actually in all of the Gospels, Jesus doesn't hold anything back. He is ordered by the court to answer the question, and he does. Yes, I am the Christ, the Messiah. Now, Mark, I mean, he has Jesus answering it directly. That's the one I read. I am. Uh, It's a big deal. I am. Uh, He doesn't stop there. He he says, you will see the Son of Man. Where's that come from, Samuel? Daniel. Daniel 7. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Well, that's bringing in Psalm 110, verse 1. This is man... Uh, as in like humanity, man fulfilling his original role, ruling with God, sharing rule and authority with God. So Jesus says, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. He refers to himself as the son of man from Daniel seven. He talks about sitting at the right hand of power, sharing rule and authority with God. And then he says, coming with the clouds of heaven. This also relates back to Daniel seven and, and sort of How do I say this? If you were in the Old Testament mindset, especially around Daniel 7, the one who's riding on the clouds is supposed to be God. But we have this mysterious Son of Man character who rides the clouds up to God. But here he says, coming with the clouds of heaven. We don't even know what that means. Does that mean he's riding on the clouds up to God, or is it actually speaking further ahead when he rides on the clouds back down? Second coming. Don't know. But as we will see, all of these things claiming to be that cloud rider and all the other stuff we mentioned, this is huge, big, crazy blasphemy in the ears of like Caiaphas and and whoever else is there. So the high priest tears his garments. Now, tearing of garments is usually a sign of grief. That sound familiar, Samuel? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also... If you were a judge in a capital case, you were supposed to do this. You're supposed to tear your garments when someone is guilty, but not the high priest. Now, again, we're confused. Are we really still in a house? Did it move to another place? Whatever. Is Caiaphas sitting around? Is he wearing the high priest garb or not? Can't be certain. But Leviticus 21.10, the high, uh, Sammy, why don't you read that? The high priest, who is greater than his brothers, and on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who has been ordained to wear the priestly garments, must neither dishevel the hair of his head nor tear his garments. So, it didn't even matter if he was wearing the priestly garb or not or whatever. He is the high priest. He is not allowed to have messy hair or to tear his garments. He is greater than all his brothers. He's had the anointing oil poured on him. He's he's the one ordained to wear the real garments. So this was a big violation. And Caiaphas just rips his garments. It's crazy. So he's obviously quite upset. He calls it blasphemy. He gets agreements from agreement from everybody in attendance. And I'm just going to say it again. There were probably few or none of Jesus's supporters there. 
how does he get agreement from all in attendance, right? He gets agreement that he is deserving of death. And so all of this seems so dramatic. And it's like, oh my gosh. And then yet, like a toothless lion, there's nothing they can do about it. They can't. Rome is the one with all the power. And so all of this has happened. And what do they have to do now? They have to somehow find a way to get Rome to carry out this death sentence. That's what we're going to see as the story continues. Now, side note, was it blasphemy? Well, it's hard to say. If we want to get super technical, maybe not. I mean, he hadn't said the name that, you know, wasn't supposed to be spoken. He referred to him as the power. He hadn't in any way defamed God. And again, that depends on interpretation. Maybe you look at it and say, but by claiming position and authority with God or sharing it with God, maybe that's close enough for them and they think that is in fact defaming God. Samuel, let's read one more thing from Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. And one who misuses the name of the Lord must surely be put to death. The whole congregation must surely stone him whether he is a resident foreigner or a native citizen. When he misuses the name, he must be put to death. Yeah. So that is like the classic definition of blasphemy. And, you know, it's up to you when you look at that. Did did he really do that or not? I think fair arguments on both sides. We we don't really have to work out. It doesn't matter. They called it blasphemy and they were going to go ahead with it. But... I think this is where we have to leave off the story, Samuel. What do you have question-wise? Yeah, I'm just, and you and I talked about this um, on our trip to Israel past few weeks, but this whole interaction that's going on with the high priests and Sadducees, etc., concerning their view of who they thought Messiah was going to be and his dynamic, because if they are tearing their robes and calling it blasphemy in Jesus claiming position and authority with God in those Daniel 7 references, to me, that makes it seem like they they didn't think that Messiah was going to have that kind of position and authority with God, or, or am I thinking of that wrong well as sadducees they didn't even believe in a messiah so you know they're they're just looking for what can we do to get this guy and if we can get him to admit to something that we don't even believe in whatever still works for us let's get him out of here so yeah i i think i i didn't mention this and it's glad you brought this up we can see even more of the disingenuous nature of their questions and the court and everything that they're doing they don't even care about this. You think you're a messiah? <laughs> Whatever. That's not even real. They could have just ignored him, but instead, they tried to get him killed. Yeah. And I'm also getting uh, like uh, with the what caused the uh, the tearing of the robes and all of the ruckus after Jesus' statement, because their question was, are you the Christ? Are you the Mashiach? The son of the blessed or son of God? Um, and at least from, I think, in a Jewish perspective, with Matthew's account, Son of God probably meant something different in traditional Judaism than compared to what Jesus showcased what the Son of God meant in terms of like a, a an expression of the one true God being present in human form, like... Son of God could have been used for someone, a descendant of Israel or David or whatever. But um, right. the 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 issue is him saying that he is coming down on the clouds with heaven in the same way with like uh, right. in John, John 6, six where like their issue wasn't with him saying that he's the bread of life and that you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. The text says that they were upset that he said i have come down from heaven and to them only god can do that so once again they are 
struggling with Jesus claiming this div- divinity aspect with himself too. Yeah, yeah, and and you're right about the son of God thing. The kings of Israel were considered son of God. Uh, Israel itself, the, like the nation, is different things. They were the anointed. But in the question, and I'm going to go back to Matthew, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Again, whether they agree with it or not, they know things. They're familiar with it. And this is saying, you are the eternal king of the line of David. Mm. Or, the, or the question, are you saying that that is who you are, that eternal king of the line mm-hmm. of David? And so, yeah, uh, that, that I'm sure it made him mad. <laughs> Anything else? That's it. We've gone too long. All right. Well, this is a good one. We've got a lot of good story in there. Until next time. Okie dokie. Oh! Thank you for listening to the Okie dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.